Um, we've got Mihi Blair from Auckland, who's general manager for National Tobac Tobacco Control Advocacy <coughs> Service at Tapai Te Hoora, who works and supports the voice of those impacted by tobacco to raise awareness to the goal of smoke free 2025 to Aotearoa. Before starting at Hapai, Mihi worked with the Ministry of Social Development as a funding advisor to providers um, and managed Helensville Women and Family Centre for 10 years. She's also accompanied by some other people out, out the back who will, I'm sure, be happy, be happy to be involved in the question and answer. Hikawai Winiata Kelly, who's from Ngati Ranginui, Tauranga Moana. She's been working at Turuki Healthcare in Mangere for seven years. She's been in various roles, starting in the rheumatic fever prevention, smoking cessation, mother and pipi, and now working in the space of criminal justice. She comes from a far now passionate about creating better, better health, health outcomes for her people. So this is in her blood. She respects the journey everybody's walked walk to enter our doors. Um, she's also accompanied by her mum, Tapuya Piniata, who taught her all the good things that she knows. But none of the bad stuff. Kia koutou katoa, nā mihi nui kia koutou katoa, um, e uh, aroa mai. <laughs> um, he hari, hari kou ki tēnei hui, um, ki tēnei koutou pa. Um, thank you everyone, um, and thank you for the introduction today. Yeah, so um, thank you um, Southern DHB for inviting us here today, and I'm really honoured to um, bring down Tūruki Healthcare um, to have a corridor with you about the new changes in the good practice guidelines and how they were a part of it. And I think this is a really good time um, because we're going through a lot of changes with the government, changing, 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 but I thought that we'll bring them down here to give you the, their experience and what they're doing with the community that they work with and that they're feeling they live with. So um, I'm going to rush through on um, my um, presentation because I think that, you know, our cordial is really valuable. But um, just sitting here this morning and being in Southland, I'm really honoured um, to be around um, and just to acknowledge my whakapapa too in Vicargo. Um, a lovely death took me to um, the cemetery in Vicargo where my great grandparents were um, are laid to rest. So I've um, got some southern blood, which I don't um, fully recognise, but yeah, really acknowledge the time that um, she gave me. Um, so also on the reflection over the past couple of days and this morning, um, it's really honed into me um, since I started actually a year and a half ago at Hapai Te Aorta managing this role, um, that we, we're vaping, we're constantly losing something. We're constantly losing a focus to the main kaupapa of Smoke Free 2025, and that's tobacco. Um, the tobacco industry in itself is just reaping and pillaging of our people um, who are dying, and this vaping has completely divided our our communities and it's really sad to see and I really hope that what we take home today is that we have gained more knowledge that um, this is a harm reduction product it has some issues it has some um, areas that we need to push the government to um, regulate and legislate so then our people stop dying that you go home today and just have that thought you know what's the biggest devil in, in that we're dealing with in this tobacco um, and to start off, um, I just really want to push um, today. We uh, Hapa Te Hauora launched a um, campaign on tobacco. Um, to, that tobacco is not our whakapapa. This launch it was um, uh, came from our uh, tobacco supply hiding that we did around Aotearoa. We met with 16. Uh, we did 16 focus groups, both sector and Fano um, communities. And um, one of the biggest things that they said they didn't recognise was where tobacco fit it in their lives, where they, they owned it like it was all their fault. They owned it that because their mum, they learned it off their mum and dad, it was their fault and they, they actually owned it, it was actually, you know, oh well, what am I going to do? So we created a piece of work that was launched today and we showed it yesterday, so I'm allowed to put it on <laughs> properly. <laughs> so, We are the voices of our ancestors, our people today, and our mokapuna in the future. 
picture. We're here to say that smoking is not our fucker papa. Tobacco is a sacred plant to the indigenous people of North and South America. It was and still is used today in sacred ceremonies and among the other purposes is believed to carry one's thoughts and prayers to the spirits. In the 15th and 16th centuries, explorers found, cultivated and exploited tobacco to the world. Tobacco was later introduced to Aotearoa in 1769 by Captain Cook. By the 1800s, it had become the standard trade item. And soon enough, more than 50% of our tiny and 70% of our wahine were smoking. Tobacco continues to be mass produced and sold globally for profit today. Thousands of other chemicals are added to the tobacco leaves that make them highly addictive and ensure our people stay smoking. Not only does the tobacco industry continue to misuse a sacred plant anti-colour on a global level and Aotearoa alone, it contributes to more than 5,000 deaths per year. No other industries or legal products is as destructive to our whakapapa as the tobacco industry. E hara no tāua te tūpika. Thank you. I'm really proud of that. That was actually my daughter. <laughs> paid her well no. <laughs> and my nephew um, and one of our um, staff members um, Tamariki as well and they, they spoke at the smoke free cars um, submission as well um, to protect their whakapapa um, so when you know when you look at your whakapapa um, in terms of tobacco mine started in 1840 when we um, gave we exchange 3,000 acres of Auckland Tamaki Makoto, that land that you saw um, to the government, to Governor Hobson, um, for four cases of tobacco. So that's where my whakapapa started and I'm sure that there will be a lot more um, of our farmer who has that case. The scenery that you saw before, that's the only land that we have left, um, 700 acres that, we've, that was left out of the whole of Tamaki Makoto. So putting into the context of whakapapa, we'd like um, those to, to think about and put your hands up of who has lost their whakapapa too early because of tobacco. Okay. So you know, that, that's what I need to bring it home to. I lost my nana at 11, so my whakapapa entered there. Auntie at 20, whakapapa entered there. I lost my father, who's Pākehā to tobacco at single one. Being Pākehā, he should have survived till my 80 or 90. <laughs> but, you know, that, that really brings it home to what we um, are trying to say. And it also brings it home to um, what we want to talk about, what I really want to talk about today, is actually it's about equity as well. We've, we've been um, displaced um, for many centuries, um, and equity's been honed in over the past couple of months um, by the Minister of, um, of Health, um, Mr Clark. So, sorry, it's a bit about us, but you guys should know. It's been on the media enough. <laughs> but, um, and that's our service objective. Sort of changed the things, but there's our service objective there. Yeah. So, um, it'll be on the slideshow um, for you guys to have a look at, open and transparent about what my job is here for Harpai. Equity. Equity that the Minister has, been, um, has asked you guys to look at. Here's their definition from the Ministry of Health. Equity is so important in, our, um, in the work that we do, and if you can understand in the story of whakapapa of tobacco, we are well, well behind on health and other issues. We are on a, on a back foot, I would say three generations of back footing in terms of equity. And it's our role as Minister has said, and I'm not a minister, I don't work for the government, but I believe in this government and his statements of equity. Um, 
Our, our job is to provide equitable services and um, actually our job is to provide equity, equitable voices to, to what we want and you know we're in it for that if you, if, um, and that's, that's it. One of the biggest things I went to the Ministry of Health Forum two weeks ago and um, they were very open. I was really um, pleased to see that they were open enough, the Minister and um, the DCA, you guys call it DC. Uh, the Ashley Bloomfield, <laughs> um, Director yeah, Director General. Um, they were really open about institutional racism that was in, in embedded into systems um, of the not only health but social services, um, and they're also open to the unconscious bias um, and having that conversation. And we really need to be open with that conversation as we go through our work. And that's what I really wanted to bring <coughs> Now also, one of the biggest things that we're also open is actually our people's voices, um, which we forget. And uh, the bonus statement here, it came from the EY report when they did the study on tax increases. There's a reason why there's a higher prevalence <coughs> of quality women smoking. It's because of, social, of our social situation and inequities between races. There's no denying that's happening. So why am I I'm talking about equity and not about vaping and I'll bring it down to vaping is that because <coughs> we need to actually look at the equity lens and give um, our people the self-determination to make choices. With um, Today I've heard, and not just today, many, many times I've heard, um, why don't we just do this, why don't we just do that? Why don't we just listen to people's voices and listen to people's needs and let them determine their health direction and their health journey? So then, um, just like our tamariki said, let them look after their well-being, and that's what we're hoping for. We want to empower and educate. So when we're looking at community voices, um, they, in my opinion, are the experts. Our community voices are our experts. Um, I sit in many research forums. Well, been around the world to have listened to researchers and one thing that's always missing is people's voices. So today I'm just going to give a quick example of how people's voices really enhance and really um, make some really good policy, in my opinion, policy decisions that are based on them, for them. Okay, so um, we did a study on behalf of Auckland Council. Auckland Council on their smoke-free policy um, was reviewed, their policy was re reviewed in 2016. There was a debate about impl implementing that into the vape, um, implement vaping into the smoke-free policy. So smoke-free and vape-free, and I understand there's um, a lot of councils that have done that. Um, and however, Auckland Council have chosen not to. They don't have that in their policy. And why is that? Because people stood up at the forum in 2016 and said, "We need a voice." Um, we need access and not being stigmatised ever again that we're trying to quit tobacco and you're trying to again restrict where we can um, have that freedom to get off tobacco and so what the council did is that they went okay well let's review this so they contracted the University of Auckland and Hapa Te Awara, um, to develop to give some research and put something in context of what would um, smoke-free and vaping, uh, smoke-free environments look like? And where does vaping sit in this context? So, we did um, a study for them, and the first thing we did was we looked at the research around that was available. So, when we looked at the research, we took a targeted approach in our research. We informed the minister, um, the council there. Focusing on the high uh, population groups where smoking is the most prevalent is actually where the investment needs to go to. Now the investment I'm talking about is the $2 million that they have um, decided to put into um, smoke-free areas for over a three-year period. 900,000 of that is actually tagged to communities to develop their own um, methods of prom uh, promoting smoke-free areas. Um, so we or even narrowed it down to um, to 22 to 45 year old Māori Pacifica, you know, and Tongans. So we really took it down, right down there, to say if you're going to invest well, this is where you should go. If you're going to invest well, these are the people that you need to target. Not the Rimawera or Waiheke Islands and and you know all flash places which I wish I could live or own. Um, you need to actually put that um, forward. So how did they look at this? We developed um, some principles in, in that area because we were tasked to develop those principles and what would vaping look like in those areas? What would it look like in those communities? 
and actually what would reducing availability of tobacco because that was one thing that we said if we're going to have this happening we need to actually look at the availability um, and reducing the supply of tobacco because that's the one thing that's um, killing us if you're going to look at this then look at both sides um, part of the thing with Auckland Council also just be aware is that smoke free policies are quite different every local, local council is different it's crazy but we um, have smoke free beaches outdoor dining um, workplaces and things like that. So this is part of the council policy that we take seriously. Um, and so when we looked at these principles, um, that was one thing that we council were pretty happy with us to do. So council had asked us to pursue a bit more further. And what we did is that we looked at the community voices. Oh, sorry, we looked at these three areas. I'm forgetting my slides. Um, and these three areas were um, part of the. Uh, these were just one of many of the three areas that we were tasked to look at, but today I just wanted to show you these three areas as part of where does vaping sit in the outdoor, um, out smoke, outdoor areas. And so when we looked at smoke-free workplaces, we actually changed it that vaping is a, it's a, it's a pos we have to provide positive vaping policies because we compared it with smoking because that's what we, we want to aim for 2025 really hard. So let's put this in till, even like, please give us till 2025 to put this in so we can really make some um, push and um, movement. And so we looked at everything in a positive space, create positive vaping policies for outdoor areas. You know, these are sorts of things that we need to actually look at. What does vaping, positive vaping policies look like <laughs> in outdoor areas? Well, it could look like that someone vape, um, had this smoking area and the vaping area is in a different area because if someone's trying to quit that and they've been pushed into a smoking area, they're not only going to be um, honed and uh, you know, seeing, setting them off and uh, go back onto a tobacco, but they're also getting secondhand smoke, which is the second leading cause of lung cancer in New Zealand, especially for Māori. Um, so we framing like what would everything look like and council took some massive responsibility in what they were going to do develop it with messages to encourage it Aucklanders not to judge and stigmatize the smokers or vapors because why would we why would why would that be council's responsibility because we said it was we told them it was because our people were talking saying it was their responsibility to help them and support them to be in a safe environment so they can connect with their whanau, their community, because they get pushed out every time they state housing, they get lost out of their community. So this, they were a contribution to them to meet their needs. So these were some of the voices that came through. We um, delivered, I think the focus groups were in the targeted areas, I think we did over 60 community groups and vape vendors as well. So these are some of the communities. Give the money back to the people, let us make the choices. We need to tell them if it blows clouds in people's faces, people are going to hate you. You know, that's a, that's a common fact. I hate it when people blow anything <laughs> in my face or anywhere. So it's about etiquette. And that actually came from a vape store owner out in, um, out in Auckland. I think the biggest one is there should be separate spaces for vaping. Asking a vapor to vape in a smoking area is like asking an alcoholic to drink orange juice in a bar. So we're really putting that into context. Like we're, but we're dealing with some realities and we're dealing with addiction. We're not dealing with anything else but an addiction. So that's why we wanted to make these environments um, um, safe for our people. So from that policy, we developed three action streams. And you can see them here. It is community led, it is community driven. We got some flat back from um, certain groups that said that um, please don't let them do that. Don't let it, don't give it to the community to drive what they want. We know what's best and these are things that I have faced every day. Um, enable community to own they can own their projects. And activate smoke free public places like active, you know, make it a priority. It's not monitored, but you know, if the community owns these smoke free areas, then they will start activating, so there needs to be investment there. Um, activity, switch to quit, that changed. <coughs> that was the only thing that changed out of the government thing, so this is um, pre, this was sent to me um, a couple of months before, before the council approved this, and it was still switched to quit. It wasn't about vaping though, it was switching to quit to get off tobacco, so they could use any other product, so that was developing. What would that look like? So, you know, these are the sorts of things that 
our council have taken on very, very seriously. And right now we are, um, have a partnership with Orphan Council to, to um, ensure the community voices are there and we're um, part of the employment um, and actually delivery uh, implementation to, um, of this project over a three year period. Because we can show how to focus on our people to reduce equity in the policy and um, policy process. So that's where I'm ending on my little cordial today. Um, I would like to ask now for Hikawai and um, Te Puya to come up um, and then we can ask any questions after that. Nani. Hello everybody, my name is Hikawai and I'm Kelly and I'm from Chiki House here. This is my mum, but she's also my boss, so today she's my <laughs> boss. Um, she's the CEO of Tuiki Healthcare. And just to start off, I know that there's um, a lot of debate going on in this room, but this is just to show you um, our journey and what vaping has done for our community um, and what it can do for our wahine Māori when they're given the opportunity or the option to vape. So I'll just let mum start off. Tēnā koutou e mahi māha ngā ki a koutou i tēnei ata. Tēnā koe whaia mō tō mahi whakatau i tēnei ata. Tēnā koe. Um, it's a great pleasure for us to be here today and uh, just to share a little bit of our journey. So our journey began back in 2017 when the Ministry of Health came and uh, said we've, we've got some really serious concerns. We've been looking at the data and Māori women are not accessing our smoking cessation programs. And so uh, we want to actually think about that data and come out and um, interview uh, whānau. Uh, so they did that across I think six uh, Māori providers across the country. So they came out to Tūruki, interviewed 20 whānau, uh, talked about um, what would make a difference for them in terms of programs. Then they took that information back, analysed it, and they came back to us and said, we'd like to share this back to your whānau. So I want to emphasise that that was really important, that they came back and gave that feedback back to whānau. Then they said to us, would you be interested in uh, developing a, a prototype program? <coughs> Given that we um, have this data, we've come out to talk to whānau, we now have analysed that, would you be interested in, a, in participating in a co-design process? Uh, so Tūruki put uh, their hands up. We're actually not a contracted provider for smoking cessation, but we are a primary care provider. We're a whānau water provider. Uh, and we do a range of things in terms of integrated care with social services. So we were very pleased to be able to participate in this space. So we ran uh, the prototype. Uh, the evaluation of that work is actually on the Ministry of Health website for you to have a look at. But the interesting thing was that often in this co-design, it's really interesting that sometimes government agencies come to you and say we want to co-design, they take away what you've said and actually it was a quick fix to a problem, a time frame that they had with getting papers to the minister, etc. And actually often the outcome is it has a very low impact. But the important thing with this process was that actually they, they took the information from the, uh, the evaluations and said, actually, how do we actually uh, begin to consolidate this? How do we actually get maximum impact out of the learnings that came from uh, the pilots? So we're very pleased to say, and to show you that this document, uh, what Mahi referred to is up on the Ministry of Health website. It's the Good Practice Guidelines, Ka Pū Te Ruha, Ka Hau Te Rangatahi. And um, it's available for all uh, DHBs, funders and planners in particular, I hope, and um, providers to, to have a look at um, what happened in the pilot and how we might think about service delivery from it through an equity lens for, uh, for Māori. 
Um, I do really want to acknowledge all of those that participated um, in this process. And I, I kind of make a little bit of a joke around the Ministry of Health because uh, tobacco control have always seemed to me to be in a dark corner of the ministry, not popping their heads up too much to um, come out and talk and uh, to be visible, but actually doing a lot of work behind the scenes. <coughs> well, um, unusually, they uh, partnered with Mighty Health and um, that was a really key partnership um, in terms of engaging with Māori providers and following this process through. So I really want to, um, although I make a joke of it, actually I'm very serious in acknowledging the work uh, behind the scenes with Lee Sturgis and Jane Chambers. They also engaged um, some Māori evaluators and also ThinkFace to help with the co-design um, and the evaluation. And we actually, because we didn't have a contract, we had to go out and find some money for this and get some support. So uh, we were very grateful that uh, ProCare came on board and um, gave us some support around <coughs> having a quit coach, which actually um, happened to be Hikawai. <laughs> uh, she was working for ProCare at that stage. Um, and uh, a friend of ours, Mariah Pipitakoko. Um, the evaluators were uh, really fantastic because they took an action research approach and just ran alongside us, said, oh, so why are you doing that? Or what does that mean when you do that? Or um, we spoke with a woman and they said this, how about we change <coughs> this up? So that there was this constant process of evaluating what we did as we were doing it. I want to acknowledge Hapai Tahawara who walked alongside us and um, also Vapo and um, I want to acknowledge Anya, who's in the room with us. They've actually supplied a free vapes um, to the women for our second pilot, so thank you. So there was a co-design process, a co-production process, a co-creation uh, process, um, but from our particular perspective, it was about uh, one co-papa and many voices. And what I mean by that is that our kaupapa was actually to support Māori women to quit smoking. The many voices were their voices, uh, stakeholder voices to come together uh, to create successful outcomes. Um, some of the learnings from um, this particular development was that um, it was important for the partners of the program to become not only designers but active participants and giving um, ongoing reflection uh, for what we were doing and what we were learning. Obviously, um, now that uh, that work and the learnings are secured in the Good Practice Guidelines, which I hope continue to be a living document. Um, I think uh, one of the biggest things that I've learned is the importance of um, funder and planner and provider nimbleness and agility uh, to work um, against learning as it comes forward and to critically think about changes that need to happen. I think our best model, um, we've taken our learning uh, from Fana Water, where we have the opportunity to fund plans and to have FTE plus flexi funding to support women um, as they are going through this process is, is really important. Um, and of course the biggest learning was that uh, for us it was never a single issue. For the women who participated in our prototype and pilot, it was never just about one issue, it was never just about uh, giving up smoking. In fact, they came with multiple issues. And we actually needed to be that door which they walked through and numerous stores um, in the faces of Tūtaki, whether it's through our primary care, social services, um, etc. We actually needed to see all of them, all of their potential, all of their strengths, and they actually needed to be able to see us, all of the many doors that they could enter through, and how we could support them um, on their journey. Uh, this is a, a map of Tūtaki. Um, so we have um, GP practices in Māngere, uh, we have them in Pangmua, we run a satellite clinic at Ruapotaka Marae in Glen Innes, 
and we also run another satellite at Epsom Lodge for the Salvation Army um, for their support um, services. So for us, uh, Mighty Women wanting to give up smoking, Pacific Women wanting to give up smoking, any door needs to be the right door, whether they're coming in through our whanau water process uh, um, service, whether they're coming in through our parenting services, whether they're coming in to see the GP or the nurse, um, or coming to our uh, groups. Any door for giving up smoking is absolutely the right door. So I'm going to hand over to uh, Hikwai to talk a little bit about uh, the group. <coughs> Um, yeah, I was lucky enough to be the um, co-facilitator for this program. We started off with about 10 women. Um, and I have been a practitioner in the past, so I have experienced um, the GBT and how it works in six weeks. Um, that didn't necessarily work for the whānau that I worked with, and there was a level of frustration for me that I didn't get to build trust back with these people who had lost trust in so many um, services before. So it was important for me to double that time and so I ended up with a skeleton of a 12 week program. Um, within that 12 weeks we had a 6 week period of engagement, 4 weeks of them um, trying their best to quit smoking and hopefully being 4 weeks smoke free and then 2 weeks of just celebration and a graduation. Um, these are some of the issues, um, this board is a board that we did one day, um, I think it was about in the sixth week of our program, and because these women had all come out of isolation, um, they weren't necessarily getting out and about or talking to anybody, so they started to talk about their experiences and, and what they were dealing with currently and historically in their lives. Um, so you can see quite a lot up there. There's 27 kids between the um, eight women that I had on that day. Um, there's lots of self-harm, lots of them had experienced suicide, um, lots of them had experienced DV. Um, so we were dealing with a lot of things and I think it was important for me to show this to the Ministry of Health because this is why we're not putting smoking, um, because we've got a lot of stuff going on and I'm walking in there saying, do you want to quit smoking when all that heavy stuff is on there? Um, so yeah, it was really important for us to and I know that might not seem relevant to you guys but the opportunity that vaping gave to them to quit smoking and where they are today is huge and we're not saying that um, we think it's right for kids but for the women that we deal with and um, the community that we deal with the issues that they face this was an opportunity for them. And, and as you can see, we gave them the opportunity to use patches, gum, lozenges and stuff. And some of them dual use with patches and vaping. Um, but that's what worked for them. One of the things that I wanted to uh, share with you about um, that particular program, and we, we could never have planned it. We, um, we're not funded to run this program, but we are quite a significant rheumatic fever provider. So we're swabbing about eight to 10,000 throats a month uh, across schools in Mangere. And um, of course, it's a fantastic a model uh, around school-based health teams to actually get into our communities and reach into um, uh, whanau that normally wouldn't come to the doctor for a variety of reasons. And so, um, one of the principals came t and talked to us about um, kids who were not either participating in sp sport, were <coughs> isolating themselves in classrooms, and um, asked us if we would um, dream up a program. So we started with uh, Fit Kids, and Fit Kids is a program where we identify kids who would like to get involved in sport and physical activity, and we use that as a platform to do path planning with them and um, some life skills. Um, so the kids had started to play netball um, during uh, their uh, program and uh, one day the women uh, wanted to also play netball and so they decided to join up. But the relationship that happened out of the first couple of games was really amazing. The kids were interested in knowing why uh, their parents and these women were smoking, 
um, they were interested in vaping, uh, so why do you do that, and there's big clouds of smoke and blah blah blah. And the women were actually really encouraging um, that they shouldn't start smoking, that actually vaping is only for, for uh, people who are trying to quit. Um, and actually uh, them encouraging them to be uh, involved in sports and other activities was going to help them in life. So it was an interesting mix. Um, a sad thing about the graduation that we had for the women was actually they didn't want one. And part of that was that they didn't know who to invite and who would support them and how it would go. Um, and so we said that we would support them, of course, and we were excited to um, celebrate with them. But actually, Fano did turn up. And uh, Fano uh, that were involved um, in the program on the sidelines have also taken up vaping uh, to support the women through that process. So lots of surprises for us, lots of things we couldn't um, have planned, but continue to be part of that rich tapestry of learning that we're continuing to have with the program. And um, I, I wanted to talk to um, um, the fact that actually when the women were coming in for the group, they would often duck out uh, because they had a GP appointment or they were actually seeing Dr. Maria Peach for um, mental health and addiction issues. And we were really relaxed with that. They actually wanted to have the program in the clinic so that they could do also a range of other things uh, while they were there. And uh, that became an important feature that actually they were accessing our mama and Pepe services. Uh, one woman had just given birth and so she was directed into our breastfeeding service Fana Water, AFI, which is our um, Healthy Homes program. And significantly, particularly in, um, in that first cohort, all of the women had had some involvement with the justice system and still were. Some had been in prison, some uh, partners were in prison, parents had been in prison, some were actively in, involved um, in the justice system, whether it was with probation or other issues. Um, and in the second prototype, uh, we had a, a number of young women. Um, they were a different group and actually had no children, but four of them were hapu. Three of them that came into the group, uh, two of them were uh, 34 weeks and 32 weeks, had had no access to antenatal care prior to coming to the group. So the importance of us again wrapping around services, uh, maternity services for them and getting them engaged in services. One of the women actually came in through our employment program and um, she was actually standing in line um, at Wins when one of our workers picked her up, saw that she was heavily uh, pregnant and took her to the front of the line and got her seen to right away. It's interesting what an act of kindness can do to actually engage with people because she's now part of our service. But I want to say that um, an increasing number of Alfano, we're beginning to have a lens over how many are actually involved in the justice system. And uh, for this young woman, she'd already spent 10 months in prison, um, was now pregnant without support, and um, due to face another um, uh, sentence of incarceration because um, she had breached twice. Why had she breached? She had no transport and um, had moved, had to move to Auckland out of Hamilton. So some key steps around getting her court case transferred to Auckland and getting her um, engaged uh, meant that she didn't go to prison that particular day. We did have another mighty baby being born in prison and taken into prison. We actually had um, we're able to support her to get a 12 month community sentence and she continues to be in the group and has just given birth. And so it's amazing when you actually see the whole picture for whanau, when you see the whole picture for whanau and you get them engaged in the services that they need. This is never just about smoking, particularly for, for Māori women. I just wanted to speak a little bit about this. This is our second group. This is Anya over here from Vapor, who's in a coma. She's going to introduce herself. 
Um, but I just wanted to just make a point. We had another birth, this one in the yellow. She just birthed her baby boy last night. So um, for this eight-week program that's been going so far, I mean 12 weeks, but we're now eighth or ninth week. So, um, <coughs> we've had three babies born to smoke-free mothers. Um, if that doesn't say anything, <laughs> then I don't know what does. But we've got um, one more left to birth. Um, and she, she's going to be smoke free too. But do you want to come up and just um, talk about your part of that? Kia ora, I know I stand here as a vape company, but I want you to know that I was one of these girls once upon a time. I smoked for eight years. I have a three year old son who now has a smoke free mum because of vaping. Um, Vapo was invited to just to talk with the girls, but I actually just brought in some vapes for them and it completely changed, changed their engagement because again I was them and I came from that lens um, that vaping was a tool but Vapo want to be a part of contributing to Smoke Free 2025 because tobacco is our enemy. So some of our learnings. Uh, what do you need to be at the centre of the programme? So if you are developing services, it needs to be all about them. Vaping is an important option for supporting wahi māori and their whānau to reduce and quit smoking. The model is one approach uh, that we've developed, there's only one approach. Um, the four week, six week quit programmes are still really important. It's about, about whānau having a range of different options um, to find a service and an approach that's going to suit them. Um, Māori providers should actually be supported and funded to actually see the whole picture around uh, whānau. And um, really, uh, we've seen this opportunity as supporting <coughs> transformational change uh, with whānau and with wahine. <coughs> the call to action is really to the DHVs and the MOH to think about how their contracts enable providers to operate in the innovation space for smoking cessation. And I really encourage providers to venture out, out of their comfort zone and to think about innovation. Because actually the Ministry are in a very permissive environment and frame of mind at the moment. And your ability to talk with them, uh, to talk with your whanau about what they want and to go and talk with the Ministry around your contract and what you would like to do now is the time to do that. DHBs need to make uh, vapes available to whānau and to wahine māori. It's no good saying that, okay, here are some vapes and I'm going to put them up on the top shelf only for special people to distribute, perhaps when they feel that uh, people deserve them. Actually, we need to have less of that behaviour and we actually need to be supporting whānau with a range of options that they choose and make it accessible to them, particularly through Māori providers and whānau water providers who can support them on their journey. And I also want to state it's important for DHBs, for MOH, for PHOs to fund the things that matter most to whānau. And unless you ask whānau what matters most to them, you will continue to guess and get it wrong. So, kia ora.